In a conversation with Piers Morgan, self-proclaimed toxic masculinity king Andrew Tate laid into Ben Shapiro, accusing him of being a warmonger. Let's watch. So Ben is a warmonger. Ben has been wrong on basically every single issue you can name. He was with you with the vaccine and, and every other war. Ben is always calling for other people's young men to go and die in some war. He seems to love it. I don't know if he has short man syndrome, but he's always behind his desk calling about how important it is that big, strong men like me go and die. And the reason he tweeted that and said that is because when Hamas and Israel, the very early in the conflict, I think it was three days in, were discussing possible peace talks, he tweeted, no, absolutely not, f them, kill them all. And I said, I said, Ben, as a man who's done his own fighting, because I've had a life of pain and violence, listen to me, peace is always worth a conversation. What I said is that we should always be prepared to at least discuss peace. He, because he's a warmonger, said, no, peace is not worth a conversation. You're this, you're that, da-da. Because he's always sitting behind his desk, he must have a booster chair, and he's always running his mouth trying to invoke violence and call for war. And I find it kind of hypocritical because a man who's so small he would die if he was slapped on the street, sitting behind a desk and screaming for other people to be annihilated, I think is kind of, it's worse than I actually think, I believe. It's insane. I believe if he was sitting here listening to this, he would say that what he's screaming for is for Jewish people in Israel to defend themselves. And all he's a Jewish ben man. All does is call for war. And I agree. Defending yourself. That's not is, all he does. That's all he does. It's and calling for war and, call, and defending yourself is very different than genocide. Shapiro also appeared to be the target of a jab from fellow conservative figurehead Tucker Carlson, who made this thinly veiled burn this week. And it used to be our first defense. You would say, well, in fact, there was a guy who used to say, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> changed his views on that recently, but, um, but it, that remains true. It's a classic Tucker put down, kind of backhanded. Um, uh, he is referencing Ben Shapiro there, because Ben's famous for that catchphrase. Um, look, this is a... This I is, don't care about your feelings was around long before Ben Shapiro, but... Um, yeah, he, well, he, he popularized they've, they've, it. They've been saying that since uh, probably the 80s. All right, I, I believe you. Remember, I mean, hell, I was a baby uh, in the late '80s. You but, came out of yeah, the womb saying seen, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> Republicans have been saying this for a while, so I'm like, eh, he kind of um, co-opted and flipped it for a new generation. So what we're really talking about here is a massive difference of opinion, and it, it's frankly, it's an ideological difference. It, it's having, it's taking on a flavor of a very bitter personal disagreements between Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens, now Andrew Tate and Ben Shapiro. It's really exploding at the Daily Wire, and it's very acrimonious, but it's a ideological difference on foreign policy. The right is, in fact, divided on foreign policy, I think, in a healthy way. There's a debate going on about where the right should be on foreign policy. The old, the neoconservatism of the aughts of, you know, Reagan to Bush um, is, is not does not have nearly the unanimity among conservative thought leaders as it did at that time. It was always less popular among the actual Republican base and Republican voters than, than the elite Republican support for foreign interventionism suggested. There was always an undercurrent of, why shouldn't we spend American tax dollars at home? What business of, of it is, is ours if the Middle East is screwed up? Are we making it better by being involved there? Are we making it better by being involved anywhere else? How does this help American security? Why don't we put America first? Um, this was something Ron Paul really capitalized on when he ran, and then it was something that Donald Trump um, t you know, came to totally dominate over the Republican Party by, by, um, by adopting a totally different view. And now we're back, we're kind of in, we're not totally post-Trump, but Trump isn't completely in charge at all times. He's not front and center at all times right now. He's actually been laying low. And we had a, 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 you know, a new war start in the Middle East and conservatives are weighing in and there's a, there's a split. There are people like Ben Shapiro who want to support Israel no matter what, and, and Ukraine, frankly. Ben Shapiro is on the funding Ukraine. That's the, the Ukraine stuff is very unpopular among Republicans now. The Israel stuff's a little bit more split. There are a lot of Republicans that, that do want to back Israel. I mean, I mean, there's a question of morally supporting Israel and agreeing with Israel and saying they're right to do what they're doing is, is one question. And then, but is it our obligation to provide for their defense at a time where Americans are suffering here and we don't you know, have enough revenue to rebuild bridges and roads, but whatever Ukraine wants, whatever Israel wants, whatever any other country wants, 
for some reason, it's America's job to pay for it. I mean, it's an age-old question. Um, there, there isn't a country that exists where people aren't looking to themselves first and what's going on at home more so than they are looking right. at their neighbors or what's going on abroad. Because they're the taxpayers. Um, that's, that's their money. That's just, yeah, yeah that, that's just how it is. And I think that coming out of the pandemic, you see a lot more people who are buckling down saying, hey, take care of us first. I don't think that that is a Trump mantra as much as it is an American one in the sense that people who don't support and didn't vote for Trump are also feeling that. Yeah. Um, but we can't slip into an isolationist posture. There are reasons why there is support for Ukraine, largely because of protecting democracies abroad. We've, we've always done that. Um, the other piece of that is that we have to understand our role in a global society. America cannot afford to be isolationist. Uh, we also can't afford to be war hawks. Yeah. And I, I will give you that. I think that there has historically been, um, at least amongst conservatives and conservative leaders, um, who chose to, in many cases where diplomacy could have possibly been enacted, chose to go another route. And that has had long-term consequences. What we're seeing now is a schism that has been largely driven by uh, the residuals of two wars that many people consider failed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you're not going to erase that history. And I think that specifically among some of the younger um, conservative-leaning individuals, they've been speaking out on it for a while. Um, younger voters in particular have been speaking out on it for a while. But being engaged in Afghanistan for two plus decades, um, the amount of money that was thrown there, the fact that it, it's right still back not to the way stable. It was when we left. Um, exactly. Yeah. I, that left a bad taste in people's mouths. And they are also looking at now um, what's going on with Israel and saying, hey, can we really root out or can they really root out? Um, can they really root out terrorism? Can they yeah. really rule out Hamas? Um, what happens if the rest of the uh, rest of the Middle East and uh, other terrorist organizations or unsavory actors end up joining together and getting in this? How long will America fund this? Those are real yeah. questions and real considerations. They also don't fundamentally believe that there will not come a point where Americans are called to act physically. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when, if, if and when that was to happen, you would see huge backlash no matter what side of the aisle you happen to be on. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. If Ben Shapiro got his way, we could very well be involved with, with ground truth. Not, you know, not to, to Andrew Tate is a, is a figure we've criticized on the show uh, repeatedly for, you know, his own personal entanglements with, I mean, he's accused of sex trafficking, I, he's accused of sexual misconduct, all sorts of things. That's got to be worked out. He deserved due process like everyone else. I don't know if the allegations are true. Um, but, he, you know, he's not someone I usually or frankly ever turn to for advice or good political prognostication. But I, I have to admit, he had, a, he had a point there that you should not— When he not, wasn't trying to, you know, balance out height and have some screaming match of who's taller and who's shorter. I'm 5'11 without shoes, so it's like, yeah. whatever. You, you are to— man Nobody's, fight, nobody's so going <laughs> against you, Amisha. Uh, you're very tall. Um, you, can, you could put Andrew Tate in his place. That would be, that'd be fun to see. Um, but when he, he, when he said that peace should always be an option, peace should always be on the table— um, I, I, I agree with that. And if there's a way for them to get peace, that would be better because we're funding, by the way, we're funding the humanitarian aid going into Gaza. That's, that's also U.S. tax dollars. We're, the, the U.S. is the number one contributor to the humanitarian aid funds. We're also, so we're the, funding, richest, we we're also the richest nation on earth. Well, but it doesn't, <laughs> well, yeah, and we're very, being forced to be very generous. I mean, we have to, we're paying, we pay for the bombs to blow the place up. Then we pay for the, the, the relief aid for the people who are victims of the bombs, why are we doing it? We're, we're, like, we're blowing up a bridge and then we pay to rebuild it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't think the American people want to do that. I mean, you talked about the importance of defending democracy in Ukraine. If it's so important, why can't Germany do it? Why can't Britain do it? Why can't France do it? It's their backyard. But I mean, we there, is do a it. Whole, there is we a whole hands on all. deck Europe uh, approach to Ukraine. So let's just no, like, act like they're not involved. Obviously, we are one. We are the largest contributor, but there are the, the European mm -hmm. Union is also there. I think they should be the largest contributor. I think we should butt out of it. And uh, look, you know, if, if you want to, if people want to donate their funds, if they want to Venmo uh, Zelensky or Netanyahu, that's fine with me. That's totally fine with me. You can do that. I support your right to do that. Um, I just don't think pe people should be obligated to pay for other countries' wars, no matter how just they are. Um, and I question whether they really impact our national security all that much. And, and in fact, I, I worry that our national security is negatively impacted by being involved, as we found, as we've learned in the Middle East. I think our biggest question with again. Ukraine is going to be around, uh, to that point, whether how long this will last, because Ukraine could turn into a Cold War, for all we know. Uh, there's no yeah. quick wrapping of that one. So They're not going to win. Like... <laughs> They're not going to win quickly, that's for sure. And, and, and Russia's uh, assault has been, um, has been slow walked as well. Yeah. So I, I, that's a very different circumstance than I think what's happening in Israel right now. Yeah. Well, right. Israel is, I mean, we're seeing the, we're seeing the 
images of the massive civilian casualty. And look, I, you know, Brianna, Brianna and I argue about this all the time. She's very, I, I mean, I don't want to mischaracterize her while she's not here. She's uh, way more intensely against what Israel is doing um, than I am, or is she, is she, I think, sees more legitimacy in Palestinian resistance. Uh, again, I don't want to mischaracterize her, so people could just go watch you know, what she's had to say on the issue or read what she tweets about it. She sees a lot more legitimacy, I think, to what the Palestinian um, and, and, uh, and their representatives are doing in order to resist the situation than I do. I don't agree with that at all. But I do worry for Israel's security and our own security at this level of destruction and what it's going to create down the line, in addition to being really morally atrocious and, you know, a lot of innocent people dying, you know, just because... You know, you can't, you know, if, if there were terrorists hiding in my apartment building and the U.S. government blew it up, I wouldn't say that was, you know, justified, even if there were terrorists in it, right? If you blow up the whole city or the whole country, like, there has to be some level of proportion to, you know, what you're doing, even if the cause is justified. And I don't know, I, I think we're those, not Those are typical rules that. of war, yes. Yeah, and I think we're not necessarily seeing that. So, all right, that was a far-reaching discussion we had based on a clip of Andrew Tate slamming Ben Shapiro. So hope you enjoyed, and we'll have more Rising right after this.